Good morning. Well, in this session, uh, we, we continue to hear the echoes of how politics interacts with the economics, and in particular, the question of international cooperation and international coordination, and to what extent the national leaders have that flexibility to what you might so, say engage in cooperative outcomes, and to what extent are they constrained by elements that exist within their countries. Uh, in particular, at this time, uh, the relationship between the European community, China, and the United States really has to be seen through the lenses of the internal dynamics in each of the three regions. We have an outstanding panel here today to, to, to discuss this. It will be moderated and led by Richard McGregor, who is the uh, Washington Bureau Chief of the Financial Times, has recently come to Washington from Beijing, and I would encourage each and every one of you to read his book about China entitled The Party, which I believe is published in the United States by HarperCollins and by Penguin in the UK. Uh, Richard, thank you. Uh, th th thank you very much. Um, we do have a great panel. Uh, as Dr. Johnson said, I mean, the, we, we, the, the way we're going to approach this is, I mean, many of you, of you are familiar with the long-running debate about global imbalances. I dare say that uh, many of us in this room are starting to create careers out of it uh, in trying to, uh, you know, track and understand why what can't go on forever, in fact, is going on forever. Um, so we want to look at it from a number of perspectives, um, from a theoretical perspective to start. And after that, we're going to get down into the weeds of the debate, if you like, and look at uh, the internal dynamics um, in US politics and polarization, uh, in uh, Chinese wealth, um, private Chinese wealth, and how that has an impact on this debate, and also about the internal Chinese economy and the dynamics and, uh, uh, dy dynamics and centrifugal forces, if you like, in the Chinese economy and that, how that also has an impact. Um, so we're going to start with uh, Professor uh, uh, Marcelo De Cecco from, and he's just trained me. I've just studied Italian for one minute to pronounce this because I, he, he assures me it can't be intelligently translated into English from the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa. Ah. <laughs> You're up first. <laughs> thank you. Well, let me first of all thank everybody and among the organizers and the sponsors for inviting me to this uh, exalted places among exalted people. What I have to say will pale in comparison with what's gone on before and what will come after, but anyway. So global imbalances have not disappeared. They're still in the limelight. There was a relapse in 2009, and then they came back somewhat in 2010, and uh, uh, we don't have the figures for 2011, at least I don't have them. However, they are taken seriously still. And uh, if you look at the G20, uh, say, staff paper done for the Paris meeting by the uh, uh, IMF, the, you will find that uh, uh, global imbalances are attributed by Blanchard and Milesi Ferretti in this uh, paper which uh, they have written and afterwards they have their own little paper which came out about a month ago, basically to export-led growth. And uh, this is a thing that we have heard before, Summers mentioned it. So, export-led growth is the culprit. And I think that export-led growth is indeed the culprit, but I want to uh, remind, since my job is that of a historian, of the fact that uh, export-led growth was an avenue of development which was imposed on the Axis countries when they lost the war to reconquer them into the, what was the scheme of the Bretton Woods uh, system. And indeed, it was very successful, although they didn't really want to play the game at the beginning. They learned it very well indeed, especially two of them, and they're still doing it, the Japanese and the Germans. Germans, of course, have a, a problem inside the euro, 
But the euro has worked because uh, uh, the global imbalance of Europe has disappeared. It's become internal in the sense that Germany is owed by everybody else. And its, uh, its export-led model now works basically vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Europe, which has become a domestic market for German goods. So uh, the export-led growth model uh, then uh, became so successful that it bothered the people who had invented it and imposed it on the uh, vanquished powers. But it didn't prevent them from uh, re-offering it again to the Chinese when it was their turn to be uh, put inside the uh, courtyard of the uh, uh, world capitalist economy. So that has uh, an interesting uh, beginning. And the end is not in sight, because what I maintain in this uh, uh, paper, in the longer paper, which you will uh, see when you see the internet site of uh, INET, uh, the uh, causation chain probably goes from what I called, and that is uh, so far a patent, the import-led growth model which is what the uh, uh, Americans have, of late, in the last 15, 20 years, devised for themselves. That is based on the transformation of the formerly biggest manufacturing uh, sector in the world into an economy run by services. And everybody uh, underlines the fact that these are the famous high value added services. Yes, but uh, Professor Gordon in 2002 proved that the greatest productivity gains are to be obtained in retailing in the United States. And retailing indeed has become huge. You just see who is the largest employer in the US. Everybody knows, I don't have to tell them. So that is a transformation which uh, looks much more decisive than the one which uh, the countries of the export-led model have uh, uh, experienced because it is altogether possible for China to transform itself into a more balanced uh, economy. I maintain that it will be much more difficult for the United States to go back to a more balanced model, although it is not impossible. It's happened elsewhere. It happened in other countries, in other places, in other times. But it requires, probably, if we believe in our own economic models, having wages and having uh, investments and having every other uh, relevant variable move in directions that probably uh, will require uh, political changes in the United States that uh, not my job to fathom because I wouldn't be able to, but uh, there are people here like uh, Ferguson and others who can imagine what it would mean going back to manufacturing. Of course, they can all become service providers. That somehow looks a bit uh, more difficult to me. Also, think of that, what happens if uh, the uh, Chinese uh, revalue, as uh, Yong Din, for instance, is uh, advising them to do, and then uh, they become uh, less export, uh, say, oriented towards the United States. Do you think the United States is going to import less? No, they're just going to import from somewhere else. So the export-led model is going to move somewhere else. But the import-led model is going to, going to stay in the United States. So this is going to be a partial solution, which probably very healthy for China, but definitely the U.S. is going to carry on having the same type of global imbalances. I don't think they're going to have exactly the same level of global imbalances, of deficit, because of uh, the breakdown of the credit system, which uh, we examined yesterday. It's not going to come back uh, and feed the consumer of last resort for some time. But all the same, in 2010, the deficit of the U.S. was back at 500, and it had been at 800, 12K, as they say now. And uh, 
Uh, that is already a comeback, which is uh, quite a, an interesting thing for uh, the world to uh, watch. Now, the uh, old people like me remember when the uh, imbalances of Germany and Japan became so large that both the Japanese and the Germans were much more nervous than the Chinese have been in recent years. They were much more bothersome towards the United States. They said things that the Chinese have never said about the United States. The Japanese said that uh, the American model was completely wrong. That the world crime, crime was, on, it was uh, rife in the United States and Japan didn't have any and the Americans uh, didn't uh, uh, value intellectual power anymore. They, they remember, they said all sorts of things. Up to the Germans, <laughs> they just uh, tried to show their impatience at every, on every possible occasion. Of course, everybody in the earlier period was uh, hiding behind General de Gaulle. General de Gaulle was such a big man that uh, he could, you could hide behind him if you were German and Italian, <laughs> and even a Japanese. But then, when General de Gaulle, uh, say, disappeared from the scene, the thing remained, and uh, the uh, stridency of uh, the cries really brought down the system and replaced it with another system. However, global imbalances, as I say in my paper, are as old as the hills. There is a famous quote from Pliny Senior, Pliny the Endler, who disappeared in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79, <laughs> where it says, uh, every year we have to spend millions of sesterces to China, he called it, to the land of the Seri, which means where they make silk, to China and India, because our women want silk dresses, perfumes, and precious stones. And we can only send them silver, money. So, there you were, every year, the Roman Empire had a global imbalance with uh, China. Well, plus a change. Thank you.